Thank you. It's always a pleasure to be in this room and occasionally on this side. So thanks for the invitation. Everything I'll discuss here is joint with Pavel Kurasov, who brought this problem to my attention over a year ago. Uh, I knew vaguely what a quantum graph was or what a metric graph is. I'll, I'll review it for you. And I always thought it was something in between a graph theory where it's combinatorics and uh, the real problems of maybe quantum chaos. And it is somewhere in between there, but the question he'd asked and the one that I will address here is about the arithmetic structure. And that turns out to be much richer than I imagined. And moreover, the main tool used to understand everything here is uh, conjectures of Lang that I will review for you, which should be better known. They are extremely useful. Uh, it's the first time I've had the opportunity to use what I will call the horizontal version of it rather than the vertical version. And I will explain this terminology <coughs> as I go along. So let me start generally. Suppose you started with a compact Riemannian manifold, x. And we'll quickly be in one dimension, but it's good to understand the background because this is where we're coming from. So if I have a compact, smooth Riemannian manifold and I study the spectrum of the divergence of the gradient operator, the Laplacian, just on functions, the resolvent of that is compact, so the spectrum is discrete, it's self-adjoint. You get a set of real numbers. Instead of writing lambda there, I'll write k squared so that the k's are real and we'll take plus and minus the square root of the eigenvalue for the reasons that I'm going to be writing down some very explicit formulae, which I'll write down immediately. So suppose you take the trace of two cosine of the square root, this is the wave operator, not the, the geometric op optics operator. If you diagonalize the operator and then formally take the trace, it would be simply the Fourier transform of the measure which puts delta masses at the spectrum with multiplicity, the eigenvalues. There's a Viles law. There'll be a lot of names, Selberg, Weil, Dyson will come up here. So there is a lot of tradition here. So there's uh, Weyl's famous asymptotic law for the number of eigenvalues less than t on a Riemannian manifold of dimension n. It's got a certain law. So that means that the number of eigenvalues here does not grow very quickly. It's got a law, power law. So that, if I think of that as a measure, a bunch of point masses, it's a tempered distribution. This will be quite important. It's a tempered distribution on the line not growing exponentially. And if you try to compute its Fourier transform in this generality, you would be surprised if you could write it down exactly. But actually, the singularities of the Fourier transform can be determined. And that's the theory of geometric optics or Fourier integral operators. You should just imagine if I have a pond and I make a disturbance, the waves will go out and it's very hard to predict them exactly. But if I start off with a singularity, a delta function, and I look at where the singularity is after time t, they propagate along classical trajectories. And that's the key thing about geometric optics. So the singularities of, the, of this function in t are all located on the set of lengths of periodic orbits. And exactly what the singularity is is given by uh, a formula of Deustermatt and Gilliman. It's this wave trace, and it computes in terms of the periodic orbits. And we'll see the periodic orbits in dimension one in a second, where everything should be much easier. And that's the background that I wanted to point out. So it's always true that you can understand where the singularities are. And exactly what the singularity is can be quite tricky. If you smooth, it will depend on the fixed point set of the geodesic flow on the unit cotangent bundle. <coughs> uh, that's where the propagation is taking place classically. If x is boundary, it can be very complicated because you bounce off the boundary. And if, if, if the manifold's got singularities, there can be grazing rays. And that's something that Melrose studied a lot. Uh, and the reason I mention the singular case is because we will now restrict to dimension 1. You might say, how many Riemannian manifolds are there of dimension 1? Well, there is one. It's called the circle. <laughs> and the circle is determined by its length. So let's just normalize the length. There's one parameter. That's the only compact, smooth Riemannian manifold. And the eigenfunctions are just e to the 2 pi i mx. And the eigenvalues are m squared. And the square roots of the eigenvalues are m. 
And if I take this sum that I just described to you, which is a sum of delta masses, and ask you where are the singularities of the Fourier transform of that, then they're just a sum of delta masses. A picket fence, its Fourier transform, is a picket fence. This is called the Poisson summation formula, which says if I have a Schwartz function, I sum it at the integers, it's equal to the sum of the Fourier transform at the integers. And that's just a shorthand for that. So that's kind of the best, that's the first crystal we'll see today, and then we can look at something much more exotic in a moment. The Poisson sum is, of course, something that in the theory of numbers, if you want to analytically continue the Riemann zeta function, or if you want to m show certain forms of modular uh, using theta functions, the underlying th symmetry is this Poisson sum. So it's something we really want to generalize and understand. And it is just the trace of the one-dimensional wave operator on the usual circle. So a measure, I will give a formal definition. This has been around for many years, but certainly has been popularized over many, many years by Yves Meir. A measure is called crystalline. If it's a measure on the line, it's a sum of point masses with discrete support, and its Fourier transform by some miracle is also a sum of point masses. And the question, <coughs> excuse me, the question is, could there be other such formulae? Now, if that was a success in one dimension, you might think, well, let's go to higher dimensions, and maybe we can sometimes compute the Fourier transform exactly. And if you're a locally symmetric space, so if you say the upper half plane divided by a discrete group, then this is exactly what the Selberg trace formula is. It gives you a formula which relates a function and its Fourier a, a distribution. The distribution is placed at the eigenvalues. There's some, something a little more subtle going on there, which I won't go into here. But you can compute the Fourier transform. It's never a sum of point masses, but it's quite close to it. And you can take linear combinations and even get to a crystalline measure. And I'll, I'll review that. I'll review it in the context of what's called the riemann guinan <laughs> Vey explicit formula, where people have tried, especially Vey and many people afterwards, to try and understand the explicit formula in terms of some geometry that might give you some clue about the zeros of L functions. So it's in the background of what we're talking about here. I'll return to this Riemann hypothesis. This is not an attack. In fact, I want to show it's not an attack on the Riemann hypothesis, but it's certainly an attack on understanding certain things. Anyway, this whole talk is going to be about a one-dimensional Riemannian manifold, and I want it to be just have finitely many singularities, and that's what a quantum, a metric graph is. In quantum graphs, that you often allow potential, which I won't allow here. Now, Avi once, like I, when I first saw this, wanted to understand well, what's the difference between a quantum graph and its spectrum, which I'm going to about des describe. And ordinary graph, which we all seem to think we know everything about the spectrum, especially when the graph gets large. Expanders, for example. Over here, the graph will be fixed. It will not be changed. And if you make the graph very big and ask about crude features, they would be probably dictated, not would be, I'll explain in a minute, will be dictated by the combinatorics of the graph, at least in the low frequencies. But we here are interested in this, uh, all the frequencies. So let me define what I mean by metric graph. So I'll call it a metric graph. It's often called quantum graph, but I, I would say a quantum graph should allow a little more general construction than just this condition here. So firstly, we have an underlying graph. And then I give the edges lengths. And that gives me a one-dimensional Riemannian manifold with singularities. It's nothing very exciting, but that's what a, uh, the graph will be. And I want to now uh, think of the Laplacian on this one-dimensional object. And the most important thing I have to explain is how do I make the boundary conditions at the singularities? And we will choose the simplest boundary conditions for the whole talk. You can re replace them by similar but not very general boundary conditions. And as I say, in the theory of quantum, graph, uh, quantum graphs, you would want to add a potential, but that's why I call it a metric graph just a one-dimensional Riemannian manifold. And you put those singularities, and you'll see how rich a subject becomes. <clears throat> All right, so uh, on the edges, the operator is just d2 by dx squared. I use arc length to parameterize the lengths. That's unique. Uh, uh, it's smooth there. There's no other geometry going on. So 
the operator is just usual d2 by dx squared as it would be if it were an interval or a finite number of intervals or something of that nature. But the question is, what happens at the edges here? And for that, we're going to put the Kirchhoff or Neumann or free boundary conditions, which are the ones that I think are the simplest. As I said, you could put some others, but let's stick to this. So the first thing is the functions will be now simply sines and cosines on each interval. Because the eigenfunctions of that, they have no option. But I'm going to have to write down some matching conditions. So there will be some very interesting linear algebra, which is the matching condition. I want the fun eigenfunction to be continuous. That's one condition. And then the second condition is I want the derivative. I want like a normal derivative condition. But the normal derivative, if it were just the graph just came to an end here, so that were the uh, vertex with just at the end a leaf like this, then I'll just demand that the normal derivative at that point is 0. So it would be Neumann boundary condition if it were just an interval. But all the action, all the interesting stuff happens when, uh, and you'll see there'll be an exponential number of periodic orbits, much like you have in, in cell, say, in say the Selberg setting. So uh, these kind of singularities are much more interesting. And there, I will demand that the, the, norm, the directional derivative, say if I orient these edges <coughs> into the vertex, I'll demand that the derivative, the directional derivative, remember I'm using arc length on these, the directional derivative into the vertex, the sum of those derivatives should be 0. So those are the two. That's the boundary condition at each vertex. And that gives me actually a, a self-adjoint operator. You can show this is a symmetric operator. You've got a self-adjoint extension. And you can see that if I have a vertex of order degree 2, so if I just have something like this, if I put the condition that phi is continuous and that the normal derivative the directional derivative that way and that way is zero, then actually v wouldn't really be a singularity. So that's just a hoax. So I'll remove all vertices of degree 2 out of the graph. They just not, shouldn't be there. And that's because a function uh, in a second order equation on, on the line, if you know phi in the first derivative, you have controlled the, the, the function, uh, which is sines and cosines. All right. So you get a self-adjoint extension, and you get a discrete subset of the real line, which is the spectrum. And it obeys a vile law. And there's a massive theory of quantum graphs, <laughs> which has been around for 30 years. And the vile law, and people study this, all sorts of things, and they do mainly numerics. But they're very interesting uh, phenomena that have been found. But the question that we're going to ask here is the arithmetic structure. Does the spectrum have progressions? Is it Poisson sum? What is the crystalline measure that you get when you take the wave trace on a quantum graph? That's what we're going to try and say. All right. For this purpose, I'm going to change the definition of the spectrum at the origin because this will fix up all the formulae. So instead of making the I now the eigenvalue, the graph was connected to begin with. So the eigenvalue 0 corresponds to the constant function, as it would. And that would be multiplicity 1. But I'm going to make 0 have multiplicity related to the Euler characteristic of the graph, which is the number of edges minus the number of, number of edges minus the number of vertices plus 2. Plus 1 would be the Euler characteristic. I'm going to add 1 to that. And you'll see why in a second. So I'm going to put the multiplicity at 0. It's just artificially arranged that way. And then I'm going to give you, we've seen the circle that gave me Poisson sum was an exact picket fence. And now I'm going to do something a little more complicated. Let's take this figure 8. And it may not be obvious. Maybe it shouldn't be obvious what the spectrum is. I'll show you how you compute this in a second. But this is the only exception to the whole theory. So this is, I'm highlighting this because it and the circle are the only different ones. This miraculously, the spectrum happens still to be in three arithmetic progressions. One with common difference, 1 over L1, 1 over L2 and 2 pi, sorry, and 2 pi over L1 plus L2. Remember, the Ls are the positive numbers. They're the lengths. And this is exactly why I, this was fixed up, because the multiplicity at the origin is now fixed up in this formula. So if I took the wave trace here and asked, what do I get on the other side? This would just be Poisson sum. It would be a union of three arithmetic progressions. <coughs> 
And we're going to call that a Dirac cone. That's a standard definition in the theory of crystalline measures. The something that's just Poisson sum in a very simple way, built up from Poisson sum, is called a Dirac cone because it's this picket fence in a finite union of picket fences. So this quantum graph has, uh, this metric graph has that as its spectrum. In general, you always have that, it's a one-dimensional Riemannian manifold, so it's, Weyl's law should hold that way, and it does, that the number of eigenvalues in the spectrum, with multiplicity always, between an minus t and t, is roughly a constant times t, the constant being the total length. And the remainder, for those of us who work on semi-classics, or used to, in my case. <laughs> uh, the remainder term in Weyl's law is where you show yourself as being a strong, uh, is where you beat the next guy or the next person. But here it's kind of trivial, as we'll see, that the remainder is at most one, just at like would be with a picket fence. If I was a picket fence, I asked you how many integers are less than x? Well, x plus a bounded amount. The bounded amount is fractional part, which is a very subtle function. The same is true here. It's still 01. So it, the spectrum is looking like it wants to be an arithmetic progression. It's uh, at a crude level an arithmetic progression. Uh, and it's got, uh, and with the remainder term, one means that the number of eigenvalues in any interval of length one is uniformly bounded above. All right. <coughs> so how do we compute the spectrum? And this is where our, uh, a Algebraic variety will come in, a torus, and Lang's GM is going to come in decisively. And I'll show you what that is. So the edges, we have to put these matching conditions. And these matching conditions were written down by a number of people. But there is a beautiful paper of Smilansky and Kotal, Kotos, which explains this uh, in terms of a, a scattering matrix, as they call it. And they think of it physically in this way. So I'm going to make it, n is the number of edges. So I take a 2n by 2n matrix with the following entries. The 2n by 2n matrix is going to have be indexed by the oriented edges. So there are n edges. So I take e1, e1 hat is it going backwards. And then <coughs> we make a diagonal matrix of n complex variables. So this is going to define a polynomial, in fact, a Laurent polynomial with some very interesting properties. So this is going to just be a diagonal matrix where uh, if uh, this is just a delta, I use delta too much in this lecture. Delta was a point mass. Delta is if f equals g, then this is 1. Otherwise, it's 0. And it's a scalar multiple zf. So in fact, uh, this 2n by 2n matrix is diagonal <coughs> with z1, z1, z2, z2. So it's going to be quadratic in each variable. But when you actually compute some secular thing, it will be uh, degree 2 in each variable, but degree 2n in all the variables. And then there's this very important quantity, which uh, matrix, which is this 2n by 2n matrix that is separate to that, which does not depend on the z's. And it's given by the following. If f, remember now we have oriented edges. So if f, if g follows f, then it's, <coughs> so if g follows f, then it'll be minus 1 f g hat. So that's checking that it's g follows f plus 2 over the degree of v. So that's the entry in the f th position, and it's 0 otherwise. And degree is the number of vertices coming out of the, of, of, uh, the vertex that it, where f and g follow. And I'll leave it to you to check that in this, this as a complex matrix is unitary. This is absolutely important, and I will return to it repeatedly. All right. So if you write down the equations and do a little bit of linear algebra, you can check that this is a critical thing to form. You form the following polynomial. I'll think of it as a Laurent polynomial. I'm defining as a polynomial here in these n variables, which is the determinant of i minus this diagonal thing times that matrix S. And its relation to the spectrum is going to be recorded now. But before I explain the relation to the spectrum, from the definition, it's degree 2n. It's degree 2 in each variable zj. And this is an absolutely critical fact of this polynomial. It connects us with the theory of stable polynomials and hyperbolic polynomials. And this is what makes everything tick. That if I look at the polynomial p, or the polynomial which inverts each of the coordinates separately, 
So P iota is of Z1 to Zn is P of 1 over Z1 up to 1 over Zn. So this is inverting all of them. I should say that there's a, a positive cone here. The lengths L1 to Ln are in a positive cone, which is where the stability condition that I'm about to mention to you is relevant. Could you show the same slide again? Yeah. OK. All right, so this polynomial <coughs> happens to be d-stable. So let me remind you what a stable polynomial is. A poly polynomial in several variables is stable relative to a set if, if, as you allow all the variables to go over the entire complex plane, if, and in the set, sorry, in that set only, it never vanishes. So d is the unit disk here. And the claim is that this polynomial in n variables has no zeros if z1 to zn are strictly in the unit disks, each separately, or if 1 over them are strictly in the unit disk. So p is stable and p iota is stable. Why is that true? That follows from that matrix S being unitary and the definition that's circular. That's obvious in this case. But it's not the only way to make a polynomial stable, uh, stable and so we'll return to that. But in this quantum mechanical problem, this S unit, the unitarity of S is what makes this uh, stable. And this real rootedness property is what's going to make certain formulae true. All right, now <coughs> there's a lovely paper of Barra and Gaspard on these metric graphs, which shows, and this is an exercise, that's why we introduced this polynomial. People don't, they usually study one graph at a time. But this, of course, marries all the graphs in this polynomial once and for all. And you'll see that's a big, a very big gain to think of it that way. So let's look at the entire function. This is very important. You look at the entire function k. k is a complex variable into this, what is basically a trigonometric polynomial, but it's an entire function. It's hard to count the roots of an entire function unless you start to count with some kind of uh, in big balls or using Jensen or something like that. So we avoid that by just. Uh, noting that the zeros will only be real because of, of the, as you vary in the complex, the only roots are real, so it's real rooted. And if you think of this as a function from k, complex line, into <coughs> this value here, and look at the order vanishing, it will count for you the spectrum of this quantum graph at lengths L1, L2 up to Ln. So let me repeat. Suppose you give me the, the graph G with, and the, the metric graph is then got the lengths, so the lengths are fixed, and you look at this map, and you look at it as a function of K, and you look at the zeros with multiplicities, just like you do with matrices, then this gives you the spectrum as a subset of the reals. Turns out there aren't any other zeros, so that's the subset spec X. PG is a polynomial in several variables, only depends on G, as the notation exactly shows, P sub G. <laughs> Correct. So clearly the zero set from this in the torus, C star to the N, is going to play a big role. And that will be the source of, of all the theorems, is to understand the intersection of the zero set with this line that's defining the spectrum. All right. And in, for that purpose, we clearly want to understand that. All right, let's compute two examples again. This came out of us trying to prove something. So let's go back to the figure eight. The figure eight, if you go and write down the spectral determinant, this is an exercise. It's just that simple six by six matrix. You compute the determinant. And you get <coughs> that the polynomial factorizes, it's not irreducible, into z1 mi one minus 1, z2 minus 1, and z1, z2 minus 1. So the zero set happens to be a union of three tori. So it's not a typical subvariety of this torus, which is just c star to the number of edges. It happens to be linear. It's sub tori. And that's the miracle why the figure 8 its spectrum happens to be three arithmetic progressions. As you can imagine, the linear structure in the torus or the subtorus structure will be somehow reflected in the arithmetic structure of the spectrum, and that's absolutely true. So this is the unique guy which has that strange property that what seems to be a nonlinear problem became linear 
all by itself in this kind of setting. On the other hand, there's a, a there was a conjecture which, it needs to, which is fixed up in this here. It's due to Colin de Verdier who was computing something else. We were trying to understand, as we would need to know, when these uh, zero sets are irreducible. And so are these polynomials irreducible or not? Absolutely irreducible. And it turns out that if you take this kind of polynomial or uh, something like that, that uh, my colleague calls a watermelon, he can compute these <laughs> things, <laughs> then uh, it does factor. There's a symmetry that you can explain why it factors. And in fact, these are the only guys for which this will be not for which the key polynomial, this polynomial of G, is not irreducible, and that's kind of critical to understand everything from here on out. So the first theorem we try to understand is the uh, irreducibility of this polynomial, which we do. As I say, this was a conjecture of Colin de Verdier. I'll say a word about the proof in a moment. And more so for us, that's very important, as to whether the zero set contains subtori of highest co-dimension. This plays a very important role in understanding the spectrum. And this theorem is the background to start using another machinery. So the theorem is that if there are loops in the graph, then it's very easy to see. You get these factors like you do in the figure eight. But in the figure eight, you've got one loop, two loop, and then you've got a weird extra one which you weren't expecting because there are only two loops in the figure eight. So that's kind of a singular situation. But otherwise, you always, if you're not the figure eight, <coughs> um, you will get this factor outside here, and this Q here is absolutely irreducible. <coughs> and if you're not the figure eight, then this zero set of Q, so this we understand very clearly, uh, does not contain a translate of a subtorus or uh, of, of G of dimension n minus one. So remember, <coughs> the torus is n-dimensional, and uh, the subtorus that we're looking at, if there's a big n minus one dimensional subtorus, is something we need to understand, and this theorem tells us exactly when that happens. So generically, the fact is, the this thing you should think of is irreducible except for the loops. Generically, mean keep keep away from these watermelons and that figure eight, and otherwise it's irreducible. Uh, so I'll tell you about the figure eight. Yeah. Um, where, where those three came from, yeah. Is there some sort of physical interpretation of what this L1 sort of L2 is doing? Or? I don't know how to see this. Uh, I'll show you some other miracle that happens that you can see it from another point of view, but it's something very special. Right. I, uh, what these zero sets, I can't, uh, in, in other words, in algebraic geometry, OK, I'll return to that in a minute. But let's stick to this for a minute. OK, so that's. Uh, uh, the first reason. The number of edges. The, this is a polynomial in n, edge, n variables, and it's the secular polynomial, and the p is this nonlinear polynomial, which is, you should think of, is always irreducible. Mm -hmm. And so the zero set is not going to be a subtorus. It might contain lower dimensional subtori, but it's not going to contain the highest dimensional subtorus unless it's something very special. <coughs> Sorry, what? What was Cohen de Verdia doing with this? Polynomial? He was studying these graphs. He was studying what are called quantum unique ergodicity on these graphs. And he did not look at the algebraic geometry, but he was trying to understand the singularities of it, which we need to understand in terms of the behavior of what he called the Gauss map, which is a map from the normal to the hypersurface to the sphere, which allowed him to classify all something called quantum limits. So his interest was exactly this. N not this, not the arithmetic structure, but some <coughs> properties of the graph. OK, so now I can tell you what our main theorem is, that there is a complete structure to the spectrum. And let me go through each statement here and then indicate where they come from later. So firstly, for any quantum graph x, that's as I've defined it, any one of them, the spectrum decomposes into a linear part and a nonlinear part. And the linear part is uh, L1, L2 up to L nu. They are, these are disjoint unions, but they're not really disjoint unions. 
The spectrum, remember, is not a set. It's a set with multiplicity. So when I write L1 disjoint union L2, if there's anything in common, I count it with the multiplicity that's forced on me. So that's uh, very, as it describes this as a decomposition of separate sets, where L1 to L nu are arithmetic progressions, just like they were in the figure eight. So L1 to L nu are arithmetic progressions, and that's the structured part, and that's sort of the boring part. And in fact, we can put our finger on that effectively. And then there's what's left over, which is just called the nonlinear part, which in the most in all interesting cases is everything. In other words, we'll be able to tell you when L is not there at all, and the entire spectrum is nonlinear. So these are arithmetic progressions, and N is not. If N is not empty, it at least has a f positive fraction of all the eigenvalues. So there's a number alpha, which is given by the via law minus the common differences. This is trivial. But if it's non-empty, it's not non-empty with a finite set. It's non-empty with an infinite set, which has many, many more properties. So if it's non-empty, <coughs> it's got an asymptotic, which is similar to the usual count. And in a way, this is all you should think about is the nonlinear part. And the span. So this was, in fact, what Kurasov came to me with the following question. What is the dimension of the span of the spectrum? So if it were an arithmetic progression, then the dimension of a Q would be one-dimensional. If it could it be maybe finite-dimensional. So we'll be using it, this Lang's gem to show that the span is infinite-dimensional. So it looks very far from an arithmetic progression. And it's actually so far from an arithmetic progression that if I give you any full arithmetic progression in the world with any common difference, the intersection of that arithmetic progression with the spectrum is at most a fixed number of points. That's probably using already the deepest finiteness theorems I know in number theory. <laughs> Schmidt plus much, much more. So this intersection is at most C points. And C is actually can be computed effective, but not the points. That's typical of these Diophantine theorems, that you can bound the number of solutions to a Diophantine equation, but never find all the solutions. <coughs> so that is effective. So this is two indications that x, the spectrum, is extremely far. The nonlinear part of the spectrum is very, very far from an arithmetic progression. Yeah. Didn't you say that you could compute this spectrum in terms of plugging in some exponentials into this polynomial? No, the spectrum is the intersection of that line as it's sitting inside this torus with some subvariety, and it's the set of points. I can't compute it in closed form. I'm telling you now the structure of that set. No, I was just confused about the not containing arithmetic progressions because I thought. No, no. The, if there are arithmetic progressions, I know where they are. They're coming from these subtora. Yeah, yeah. But in, typically, if you set it up, okay, the, this theorem will tell us that exactly. All right. Uh, let me skip this for the space of time, it's for reasons of time, but there, uh, in, in the theory of crystalline measures, one is very interested in where you can keep the points uniformly bounded from each other. They love that. That's called uniformly discrete, or in the set of eigenvalues, you're saying the spacings between the eigenvalues is uniformly bounded below by a fixed number. That's equivalent to the set that you asked me about, Colin de Verdier, this real co-dimension one set where the zero set is zero being smooth. If there's any non-smooth point, this feature fails. But luckily, there are some examples where this ha happens to be smooth. It, it doesn't want to be smooth, but we have some very beautiful examples where it is smooth. OK, so the far, uh, this here is sort of the main descriptive. This is telling you, I don't know which happens, but whatever happens, it's structured. This is a complete description. And this is for Avi. If L1, L2 are all equal, then are we really doing something new here? I mean, the, uh, then I should be able to tell you everything in terms of the gr underlying graph. So if all the lengths are equal, it turns out the spectrum is the spectrum of the Laplacian on the graph, as you normally define it, and put into an arithmetic progression, because there are infinitely many. So just periodized by some period that you can compute. But when they are all linearly independent, then it's, this is what the subject's about. How do these lengths inter change the nature of the spectrum. So if the lengths are up to a scalar rational, all rational, so projectively rational, uh, 
then the nonlinear part is empty, everything is just a progression. At the other end, if the L's are linearly independent over the rationals, which is the case that most people would think about, then unless you're the figure eight, then the number of uh, linear, uh, of these linear things is the number of loops. And if there are no loops, and this is the most important thing, then the spectrum is purely nonlinear. That's the interesting case. So you've got no loops, you kind of a, irreducible thing there. You're not the figure eight, which happens to, well, that's what loops anyway. But <laughs> then everything is nonlinear. And then this is an extremely exotic object. And one that many of us have thought of for other reasons that I'm going to explain. Them. All right. Now let's compute the trace. Now, would, you go, would you go back and just, yeah. this, I want to make sure I understand the last part of what you're saying. So, if L1 to... So, the so when, when is it uniformly discrete? Uh, oh, this one. Uniformly discrete means that the eigenvalues have a sep fi separation. fixed separation. And then that, that is equivalent to the zero set, the real zero set in the product but, but of... I have no... I see. Uh, so uh, is that going to be generic or not? That's, no, uh, that's going to be not generic. Okay. Definitely not generic. No, definitely, no, definitely. That's very special. That has to be engineered very good. Very special case. Yeah. Okay. Now the next statement is what? That that if the lengths are f that's trivial. If the lengths are independent, yes. okay. and you have no loops, yeah. then the entire spectrum is the nonlinear part. There's yeah. no linear part. So really, you, the linear part comes, and we understand where it's coming from. And there's no nonlinear part, and the entire spectrum is this uh, newly kind of unstructured nonlinear part. <coughs> Okay, what's it got to do with crystalline measures? So we wanted to compute the Fourier transform of the sum, the wave trace, which I said from general principles is going to be concentrated on the lengths of the periodic orbits. Okay, so we have this one-dimensional Riemannian manifold, and I have a walk around this graph. A closed loop is what you think it is. I started a vertex, and I walk around. I'm allowed to backtrack. This is very important. And I just walk and then come back to where I start. If I do that then repeatedly, that will be, uh, so that's a periodic orbit. A periodic orbit's primitive if, I mean not primitive, if I do that twice, then it's not primitive. So there are periodic orbits and there's a primitive part of a periodic orbit. And the length of a periodic orbit is just the length of the distance you've traversed on this metric graph, which is the sum of the lengths. So it's L1, M1 plus L2, M2 plus L, M, N, N for some integers m. So I understand you're allowed to go around several times, but can I go back and forth? Yes, absolutely. Can you can you every, every periodic orbit, and, and of course periodic orbits are, are <laughs> up to cyclic permutation. And here's the amazing thing. The Fourier transform is like in Poisson's sum. It's a delta mass at the origin with the weight that's in Viles' law, as you always expect. And then it's delta masses at the lengths. It's even. Everything's even here, so the lengths are positive. So it's delta masses at the lengths. There's a term here that is very familiar from the trace formula. It's the primitive length. And then there's something new here, that a, a phase, which is when I go around the periodic orbit, each vertex I hit, I multiply. Remember there was that matrix S, scattering matrix. I multiply the scattering coefficients around the periodic orbits. They're not of one sign. They change signs. You saw that there were two definitions. It was either zero positive or negative. And so you're summing a tremendous number of elements here. They're an exponential number of periodic orbits. You're summing this exponential number. And still what you're getting is grouped together into all the guys with the same length. The number of lengths less than x is only growing polynomially, which is very important here. So <coughs> this is a crystalline measure by staring at it. This is tempered, because the number of eigenvalues up to some number is fixed, uh, growing polynomially. This is writing down the Fourier transform. It's a bunch of delta masses at the lengths, and this is where it's supported inside there. So this is a crystalline measure, and it's a brand new crystalline measure. So let me remind you what a crystalline measure is. The number of distinct lengths up to up to a size t grows at most like t to a power, depending on the dimension. I'm going to get to the prime numbers now. They grow exponentially. 
This is a fundamental difference. All right, so what's a crystalline measure? Formal definition. Any measure which is the sum of delta masses whose Fourier transform is the sum of delta masses, which seems like that should never happen. And they both discrete. It's called a crystalline measure. If you can talk about the Fourier transform, so at least one of them has to be tempered. So mu is tempered. So then mu hat, by definition, is tempered. And that is the definition of a crystalline measure. The most important example, as we said, was Poisson's sum. We got that from the circle. Are there others? This has been a question for years and years. Well, the first person to really study this was Guinand. Actually, using Riemann's explicit formula, I'm going to give you Guinand's example of a crystalline measure. Everybody calls this formula Bayes' explicit formula, but it's very explicitly stated in Guinand, and Riemann could have derived it if you asked him. So I call it those three names. Vey was certainly massaging this with a certain purpose in mind, and after him, Paul Cohen, Alain Kahn, and many, many people. But this is what the uh, Guinand <laughs> observation is. If you take two, I want to get point masses. So I have to take the difference. It's very hard to make it positive. So I take two Dirichlet L functions with real characters with conductor Q1, Q2, and I write the zeros as a half plus I gamma. If the, the non-trivial zero. So if the Riemann hypothesis is true, the gammas are all real. <laughs> this formula will be true. I'll only interpret it as a crystalline measure if these numbers are real. So you take point masses at the zeros with multiplicity for the one and subtract or minus that plus the, the other one. That kills certain terms in the explicit formula, which will make sum of point masses, its Fourier transform, a sum of point masses. So I'll get a delta function at the origin. This is the ratio of the conductors. So if I take the same guy, I get zero, but otherwise this is serious. And then I get something here, which has got a log p, the log of the primitive. Looks very similar to what we saw there. The difference, because I'm subtracting, and a square root here, and a delta mass at m log p. And if these numbers are real, the, the number of zeros up to high t is t log t. So somehow, if we're ever going to interpret the zeros of the Riemann zeta function in any uh, setting like this, as many people have been trying to do, it's got to be like a singular one-dimensional problem, which is why this quantum graph is beginning to move in the right direction. Uh, we one-dimensional, not singular one-dimensional. So we've subtracted two of these to get around that difficulty. But the number of zeros is about t log t. So this is a tempered distribution, if the Riemann hypothesis is true. And so this is tempered. Of course, that's saying there's tremendous cancellation in the sum. That's what Riemann says. But notice that the, ap the, the measure mu hat is not, the absolute value of that is not tempered, meaning if I put absolute values here, there are too many primes in an interval. So this is what I was saying. The support in the other case grows polynomially, and all the guys collected in boxes are enough to make something maybe tempered. And it turns out that that's going to be a fundamental difference. There's a beautiful, I was talking to Dyson, who unfortunately couldn't be here, but he has a beautiful paper. I urge you all to read it. It's called Birds and Frogs, and he, he says he's a frog. <laughs> that's, that's a highlight of the paper. <laughs> and then he'll more or less go around telling each of you what you are. But then he has this uh, rather, this is his Einstein lecture from about five years ago at the AMS. He explains uh, the discovery of quasi-crystals and crystalline measures, and he suggests that people must try to classify, this is a very difficult problem, to classify one-dimensional crystalline measures, because that's the frog's approach to the Riemann hypothesis. In other words, if you understood the structure of all these crystalline measures, maybe one day you'd find in your list this guy. <laughs> this seems like you crazy. Well, maybe that's a frog's way of approaching it. I'm just repeating what he says. OK. I don't think this is a, um, necessarily b uh, the right way to approach it, but it is a way of understanding this kind of measure. And these measures are independently by me uh, being studied uh, in terms of uh, higher dimensional, uh, higher dimensional um, like uh, Penrose tilings, where they are constructed by first projecting onto the line and making measures that are related to these. <laughs> there are a number of theorems which actually classify them, so as D uh, Dyson was suggesting, but they put some serious condition uh, 
on the absolute value of the Fourier transform. So if the A lambdas all lie in a finite set, and by the way, our measures have that property. Our measures are delta masses, and at each point we have a multiplicity. That multiplicity is uniformly bounded. And such a measure is, if it say, that, say it was simple, we can arrange it at two, then it's called an idempotent. The coefficient is either zero or one. And what uh, Mayer proves, using actually Paul Cohen's famous idempotent theorem, based on the proof of the Littlewood conjecture, is if the absolute value, the measure on the right-hand side, if you put coefficients with positive, if that's translation bounded, so some serious condition on it, that is that the sub over x of the mass it gives to any interval, no matter where you put the interval, is bounded, then you actually have to be a Poisson summation. So there are many theorems that put other conditions on a crystalline measure, forcing it to be Poisson sum. Well, that, that's a finite set, but that set depends on graph, right? In our case, it depends on the graph. Theorem. In his theorem, it's any crystalline measure. This is a theorem about crystalline measures, sorry. This theorem of Eves Mayer is take any crystalline measure which satisfies the following yeah, problem. You said yours, it's Ours, but, but it depends on the graph. On the graph. Yeah, yeah, it, it could be, it, it could, could, big, absolutely, you can make it big. Yeah. All right, so uh, these crystalline measures are very exotic. And in fact, uh, now that we, once we produced them and looked at the literature, these uh, answer many questions. In fact, the most basic question that had been open for a long time was, can you make a positive crystalline measure? And these are. What do you mean positive? That is, the mu is a positive distribution. Mu applied to any smooth function is positive. It's non-negative. Notice this feature, which the prime numbers don't have, the absolute value, is tempered. And that is something that's often put in in the definition of a crystalline measure in some literature. So this is, these measures are very far from Dirac, uh, from Dirac combs, as they call them, because they, the dimension's infinite. There are no progressions in the general case. We can make them idempotent, most importantly positive, so you can do all these things. Yeah. They must, because the exponential number, this, by the way, when you go from a graph, which is just one loop to many loops, there's already the, the number of loops, periodic orbits, is exponential in number. But there's, 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 it's not like uh, I have an interpretant you want in terms of square root cancellation. If it's uniform, yes, but not if it's not a uniform graph. This is a general feature. Yeah. No, nobody's ever constructed a positive one, which wasn't a Dirac comb. That was a big question for many years. Yeah. OK, so where's all this coming from? So this is clearly an exotic. Uh, uh, let me just say that uh, one doesn't just have to, one can make these constructions out of stable polynomials that come from other sources. Perhaps the most interesting, con well, I don't know. Maybe June won't agree with me, but one way, one standard source of stable polynomials is the Li-Yang theorem and the proof of the Li-Yang theorem, which goes to several variables. See, what's going on here is usually you introduce a polynomial and one variable is real rooted. But the way you prove it, when you really understand it, is to separate out the variables and then make all the variables equal at the end, or go on a line where it's uh, some subtorus, or in our case, where we're going on an irrational subtorus. So the stability condition, which is free of which line you choose and how you understand it, that's a very potent thing. And so P and P iota both being stable polynomials is something that can be used to make these measures without coming from a graph and without proving it through this dream of always proving something is real rooted through self-adjointness or unitarity. The Li-Yang theorem provides examples through other sources there's other proofs of stability, and there are operations which preserve stability, which allow you to make many more polynomials which are stable. So this is the feature that I think is most important in this construction, even though we fell on it by these graphs. And then you can still use this theory that I'm about to tell you. All right, so I want to spend just two minutes quick. This, the first, the irreducibility is something that is kind of a standard thing in graph theory. In other words, <coughs> um, you're going to reduce the problem to smaller graphs inductively. So if you contract a graph, like sub suppose I have this edge here, 
and I contract that edge to there, which means make those two vertices, remove that edge, and keep the other edges. I will reduce the number of vertices. I might make multiple loops. So I increase my definition to allow multiple loops, which I didn't in the very definition, but in the beginning, but for this purpose, that's fine. And if the uh, polynomial in n variables, so you then prove a lemma that basically when you do this operation, you more or less make one of the variables one, or you would restrict to a torus. So you kind of, when you contract, you get to a polynomial with fewer variables in some obvious move. And so you can keep on going down and get down to a finite list of polynomials, which are maybe irreducible, and then try and navigate from anybody to that finite list to show your original one was irreducible. That's the proof. But that's where the watermelon came up. We found that as a guy where we got stuck. And so what, the, there's, a, there's a finite number of graphs we have to consider. It's about 10 of them. I think he's got it down to five now. Uh, we're here to compute that the thing is irreducible by hand. <coughs> so that's kind of an inductive proof. Uh, but since it's so important to us uh, that it's irreducible, uh, this is an important part of this work. OK, so now. In 10 minutes, let me introduce you to one of my favorite theorems, and it should be much better known, and this should be taught in linear algebra. <laughs> because there are many problems that look nonlinear, but they're secretly linear, and that's what's going on here. They're secretly linear, and it's a deep Diophantine fact. And this was the conjectures of Lang, the first and simplest conjectures, which when placed in the language of abelian varieties, contain by far the deepest theorems, Folting's proved that case that we know in Diophantine geometry, especially higher dimensions. So let me just review what this is, what we need here. So we are sitting in a torus. So the, the Lang's GM, the word GM stands for multiplicative group, which is just C star. And our C star was to the number of edges, so we have a torus C star to the N, which is an algebraic torus with pointwise multiplication. And now let V be any algebraic subvariety, even reducible. Any sub-variety defined by polynomial equations, Laurent polynomials, because we are looking at the multiplicative group. So we've got a sub-variety V sitting inside there, and we want to intersect V with certain sets. And the theorem is that it looks very complicated, but in fact, everything up to some features which are non-effective <laughs> are effective, uh, or linear, not, not, not effective. So the, the theory breaks up, in my view, when I first was working on this, I needed it in the torsion case in my very first encounter with this. So let me explain the torsion part. Suppose I look at the points of finite order in the torus, and I ask, what is T intersect, what is V intersect the torsion? So this is an exponential Diophantine equation if I put Z equal exponentials. So you got this equation, then you're asking, what are the roots of unity that sit in this variety? And the answer is, it's not complicated. And this is effective. All right, so that was the simplest version of Lang's original. Oh, so what's it say? What's the conjecture say? I, I haven't, I'm about to state it. Oh, okay. So the vertical Lang is that if you have a subvariety of the torus as above, then you're given the torus, you can go home, you come back with finitely many subtori. So that's linear subspaces in this torus setting. T1 to D nu, such at the, which are contained in V. So you find these finite number of subtori which are contained in T, such that the intersection of the torsion points with V is actually the intersection of the torsion points with this linear subspaces. The rest is irrelevant. So what looks to, to be a highly nonlinear problem is in fact linear, if you're solving for roots of unity, torsion points. OK, that was one of Lang's conjectures. <coughs> and it's, of course, what's responsible for much of what I'm saying there. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, so these are torsion points. T1 are contained in V. I'm finding the subtor or translates <laughs> by torsion points. OK, let me just say one word about one of the proofs of this, because this is a much easier theorem, but it has been generalized recently to, a be, uh, well, abelian varieties called Manin Mumford to Shimura varieties. So here's a proof of this. I have to put it here because it's the worst proof. It's one I found many years ago, and it's the one that actually is my result. It's a nice story when you give the worst proof, but it's the only robust one. 
So suppose I have a sub-variety of, of a torus. Let me just look at that. We're looking at torsion points, so everything's in the unit circle. So maybe that's a sub-variety in dimension is 2, and I'm looking for points of finite order sitting on this curve. And maybe the equations are defined with coefficients in some field. It could be a transcendental field. But let me take uh, any element in the Galois group of the extension by these nth root m and m1 and m2 root of unity of that field. And if I have a point lying on the equation, then if I take this Galois image of it, it will also lie on the equation. So the point here about the vertical way you might prove this kind of theorem is if there's one point, the, if this Galois orbit is big, there are many points. And if you can show separately that there aren't many points, then this tension will say that you don't have points of large order from some point on. And the important thing is that the Galois, the uh, size of the Galois group of the nth root of unity over the rationals in the same is true more generally is about phi of m. It grows quite f fast. So you see, you just need a non-trivial upper bound for the number of points, say, in dimension 2 on a line which have rational points. So if this variety doesn't contain a line, then because it's curved, it contains less than m, m to a power less than 1, and that's already enough to get this full theorem in that simple case. And once you see this, you realize, well, that probably is true much more generally, but it took a long time. <clears throat> so, for example, Pila Bombieri used, I conjectured, and they proved that if you have a transcendental curve, then you would have, at most, they give a sharp upper bound for the number of points on such things. Then Pila and Wilkie generalized this to O-minimal structures, which is a very big uh, advance, which allowed eventually for the proof of Pila and Zimmerman, which is the Andre Oort conjecture, which is all vertical stuff, meaning you have a sub-variety of a Shimura variety, and you're looking at special points like CM points in bigger and bigger fields. That's why I call it vertical. And that stabilizes. From some point on, they all lie on special sub-varieties. In our case, it was all linear. In the case of abelian varieties, that's the Mani and Mumford conjecture. All of these can be proved by this method in the vertical. But what we need in this problem is the horizontal, which lies much deeper, much, much deeper. And it starts with Roth or with Tua Ziegel. And let me explain the horizontal version. So now we have a sub-variety of a torus. Everything's the same. And I have a finitely generated subgroup of rank R, R generators. And I ask, what is the intersection of all the elements in this finitely generated subgroup with the sub-variety? Sub and that also has a structure. And Lang conjectured it, meaning there are a finite number of tori, subtori, or translates of subtori, such that the intersection of this finitely generated subgroup with V is the same as the intersection of that subgroup with those tori which lie inside V. The hardest thing here is to find the zero-dimensional <laughs> tori, which is allowed in this, which means that this finite Sub, uh, if there are no subtori, which are at least one dimensional, this would say that gamma intersect V is finite. That's a deep, deep finiteness theorem. And it's effective in the number, but not in the points. In other words, if I ask you what points lie in the subvariety, the technique does not offer anything to that because the technique really says if there are many points, I'll show you there isn't another point. So it's ineffective in a very serious way. All right, this version of Lang's conjecture, which is the much harder version, was first proved by Michel Laurent in the 80s. And he used a theorem which is uh, a changing game changer due to Wolfgang Schmidt. He's the first to understand that you can make higher dimensional finiteness theorems where everything before was curves, really. It was all about curves to a Ziegel. And this is called the Schmidt subspace theorem. And I state it here, but I'm running out of time. So let me just say there's a vertical and horizontal and what the theorem that we use, and I'll stop. So there's a way of combining the vertical and the horizontal together, which I don't know how to do in a, in a, in a Shimura variety, but I know how to do in an abelian variety and in a torus. And that is we have a finitely generated subgroup. That's fixed. And I want to know the intersection of that with the subvariety V. It says that there are a finite number of subtorides. 
But suppose I take the division of this finitely generated subgroup, which are all elements whose power is in the group, some positive powers in the group. So now this is a much bigger group. So the division group of one is all the torsion points. So now I can unify everything by saying, is it true that the division group meets V in only finitely many subtora? And that's the big theorem. And that's true. And that, uh, in the version that we want, which is free of the field of definition, notice, <laughs> I don't know which, with the spectrum, I don't know what field I'm lying in. Maybe transcendental all the time. If it's transcendental, the dimensions, certain dimensions will go up. So there's an absolutely beautiful work of Schlechewey, which takes, which gives a, a absolute version of the Schmidt theorem, which is free of the number field in which it's defined. In other words, it defines a height of a point, and it self-normalizes. So if a point lies in Q, it's its normal height. And if it lies in some extension, it's normalized to be that in any further field that you might define it, it's still the same. And there's an absolute height version of the Schmidt subspace theorem, which gives complete uniformity. And once it's uniform over all number fields, it doesn't matter, then it's uniform. Then by specialization argument, it's uniform <laughs> over any choice of anything. And that's the ultimate version, which says that things only depend on the rank. The number of tori in which you have to worry about hitting is fixed. But actually finding them, that's non-effective. So that is an amazing theorem of Everster, Schlichewey, and Schmidt, which is still quite, Everster is still refining these things in other settings. That, so if there's anything that you remember from this lecture is whenever you have a torus and you're intersecting some complicated algebraic set with finitely generated subgroups or with roots of unity, their structure. The only way that can intersect is because there are actual sub-varieties which are linear, those where all the points come and then there's some little fr finite number of points left over. And I haven't shown you how you use that, but you can imagine that that structure converts itself to the structure that I gave you in the so spectrum. Using this to we're using the heaviest version, to absolutely, to get the dimension and everything. I'm using the horizontal version. The vertical version is something that comes up naturally with finite abelian covers and periodicity of Betty <coughs> numbers and many applications that people have given over the years. Uh, the horizontal is, is, is uh, for me, the first. Uh, it's, not, it's been used in difference e linear difference equations uh, where you actually study one, one variable thing. It uh, goes back to Mahler and people like that. But this general theorem, Lang understood the setting. And he understood that this should also be true in the abelian variety, and that was proved by Faltings, and that's his uh, Diophantine approximation proof of the Model conjecture. Thank you. Thank you.